What's up guys, this is Anime Crossover, I'm back with a new episode of Fred of Naruto, who has started Flash in DC Part 16, and if you did you enjoyed this video, give this video a like, and if you know my channel and like my content, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more crossover fictions with a twist, now let's begin this new video. Chapter 10, The Last Days of Normalcy April 2015, only huffs and sighs could be heard, along with the normal booming of high altitude wind, it's ironic that Naruto ended up there. He was outfitted for the elements, carrying a hiking pack and a climbing claw to help him steady himself as he ascended the mountain trail. He walked up to the edge, drank some water, and then checked his binoculars to make sure they were pointed in the right direction. Jiraiya, who had been following him, began panting and wheezing, interrupting Naruto's brief rest. The seasoned spy slumped on the ground to catch his breath. You alive, old man? Naruto inquired, his gaze fixed on what he could see through his binoculars. As he struggled to catch his breath, Jiraiya said, just give me a second. He drank some water and ate a protein snack. Why couldn't I go back to Central City with Gara? This irritates me. Naruto said, and miss out on all the godfather-godson bonding time. Furthermore, don't you have increased durability? Enhanced, Jiraiya clarified, not speedster endurance like you. But why was I dragged along with you to this worthless mountain range in Tibet of all places? Bruce mentioned she's dangerous and unpredictable, but she could be my best shot at rescuing Oliver, Naruto reminded him. And forego the exercise and fresh mountain air. Besides, I'd appreciate some assistance. Bruce provided him with information about the League as well as the name of an old acquaintance who could assist Naruto. Despite Bruce's warning that battling the League would be difficult and that he would require support even with his powers, Naruto was glad for the help. Thanks to such help, they were able to establish a monastery in the Tibetan Himalayas. Naruto sent Gara back to Central City to finish their business in Gotham while he and Jiraiya flew to Tibet. And you're still sure about this? Jiraiya inquired. I mean, I know Bruce is the best investigator in the world, but I don't think there's anything up here. You sure about that? Naruto asked, raising his binoculars, he then pointed to the northeast. Jiraiya stood up and turned to see a mountaintop monastery. Because, to me, that appears to be something. Jiraiya handed him the binoculars and led him to the monastery, saying, yeah, no one likes a smartass, kid. They were successful despite the fact that it took some time and arduous maneuvering. Jiraiya questioned Naruto on why he hadn't simply sped them over there. The reason for this is that Naruto didn't want to risk breaking his neck by slipping on ice, snow, or a rock. It was also an excellent workout. They climbed to the temple's entrance and examined the stone statues of legendary beasts and monsters found in temples all around the world. Along with the statues, there was Arabic calligraphy over the entryway. Jiraiya stopped Naruto from taking off his rucksack to use his tablet for translation. You don't need it, Jiraiya said. It says Demon's Lair on it. We've come to the correct place. Are you sure about this child? I'm not sure, to be honest, but the good news is that if things become worse, I'll be able to get us out of here, Naruto said. Jiraiya recalled, more like when things go bad. All right, let's finish this up. When Naruto pushed open the door, they were greeted with warmth from the shelter and fire. The chamber was designed in a way that made it appear to have been there for a long time, and the only light came from the sun and a number of torches arranged along the walls. More demon pictures and sculptures were placed in the corners and on the walls. In the main area, they saw eight black-clad men and women sparring violently. Naruto unzipped his jacket and placed his rucksack on the ground before proceeding. One of the women in black threw her opponent to the ground before turning to face Naruto and Jiraiya. Who exactly are you? As the other men and women came up, Naruto remarked, a traveler seeking a word in the assistance of the demoness. I just want to talk to her. I don't want to get into a fight. Then you've come to the wrong place, she said. Those who make demands of the demoness receive bad news. Either leave or die. I'm sorry, Naruto said, but I'm not leaving until we talk. Naruto grabbed the blow she delivered and twisted her wrist. I guess that ends the talking portion of this, Naruto said as he tossed her over his shoulder. After landing on her feet, she was kicked in the face with a boot. Naruto quickly dived under a spin kick before performing a leg sweep to turn the assassin onto his back and finish the battle with an axe kick to the face. He deflected a right punch and executed a throat chop before knocking him down and punching him in the face with a left cross. He evaded another round of strikes before grabbing the killer by the head and throwing him face first to the ground. He rolled forward and kicked out another assassin before roundhouse kicking one more and flinging another to the ground. After hitting one assassin in the gut, he tossed him over his back, pivoted, and shot an elbow into the gut of the last assassin before ending with a knee to the face. Jiraiya was still standing at the door when Naruto exhaled heavily. 
I'm just going to step outside and let you handle this, the old spy said as he strolled outside the temple while the assassins stood back up. As Naruto readied for another battle, the assassins charged. When a woman cried, hold, they came to a halt, I told them to stand down. The assassins had relaxed and were no longer a threat. Naruto turned back to see the woman who had stopped them standing on the second floor balcony. Wearing black armor and a sword on her back and a bandolier of blades around her waist. A tiny child, no more than four years old, sat next to her. You claim you've come to see the demoness. How do you know she's here? Amazing abilities for someone so young. That alone piques my interest, and it is the reason they no longer assault. Naruto said, probably because she's speaking right now. Talia al Gul, Ra's al Gul's eldest daughter, is who you are. How dare you speak to the demoness in such a manner? exclaimed one of the vocal assassins. Talia, on the other hand, told her to keep quiet. Talia commented, so, you know my real name and my father, but you haven't told me who you are or how you got here. Naruto explained, a friend in Gotham told me about you after I helped him. Talia recognized who he was referring to right away. They needed to talk out of sight of spectators. Talia commanded them to go, but her minions refused. They sighed and whispered, now. Some of them licked their battle wounds and sneered at the intruder. Damien, keep up the good work with your studies. The boy nodded and walked away, leaving Talia and Naruto alone to talk. Cute kid, Naruto asked rhetorically as Talia climbed the stairs to bring the two of them on the same floor. Do you train all of your assassins at such a young age? Talia walked over to a table, poured two glasses of wine, and asked, So, the detective sent you here? How's Bruce? Talia approached him and handed him a glass, saying, He's okay. It surprised me to learn that you two knew each other. Talia sipped her drink and noticed Naruto sniffing the cup, oh, the detective and I know each other quite well. I would never poison you. If I were to kill you, it would be in a martial arts competition to determine how skilled you are. Naruto took a short sip out of politeness, but that was all. So, the detective gives you information, you come here knowing my father, and your fighting prowess demonstrates skills very familiar to me, she queried as Naruto gave her a glance. Can you tell me how Oliver is doing? I'm referring to Oliver Queen, also known as the Arrow. Naruto was taken aback by the news, you've heard of Oliver? Talia responded, do you know him? I tutored him. A year before he returned to his city, I tracked him down in Russia and taught him how to use his darkness to combat the evil he would confront. Many of the strategies you used against my students were familiar to me. So, what led you here? I come to ask your assistance against Ra's al Ghul and the League of Assassins, Naruto said. And why would you think I'd help you against my father? Talia inquired. Naruto's analytical abilities amazed her as he said, well, call it an educated guess, but something tells me you guys aren't exactly on each other's Christmas card list. When Bruce told me you were his eldest kid, I was intrigued as to why his firstborn would abandon the league and form her own legion of followers. That brought me to my conclusion. Dot you and he had a falling out. My guess is that it is about who will inherit his title. Though not as amazing as Bruce's, this is still excellent. My father and I eventually fell out because he would never have passed his mantle onto a woman, Talia explained, so I forged my own path. And I'm impressed, Naruto said to Talia, especially given who your father is, but I can tell you from personal experience that you can't run away from your past, you have to battle it, she questioned his previous experiences, because your father and the league are after Oliver and his friends, I come to find you. Talia wondered why her father, the demon's head, would devote so much time to Oliver, the demon's head is my father, warlords and political figures shudder at the mention of his name, why would he devote his time to only one man, a guy the first taught who is capable of great things, so why has my father thought Oliver a worthy enemy to face? Talia was taken aback when Naruto said, your father has deemed Oliver fit to be his successor because of the problem you ran from. He wants Oliver to be the next Ra's al Ghul, and Oliver doesn't want it. Bruce hinted at what Oliver might expect with this whole heir to the demon thing. Bruce would always be at odds with the League and how we conduct our business, Talia said, because my father had thought he would be a fine successor, but that would not happen. Talia turned her head, but Naruto could see she scoffed and rolled her eyes, you mean he's against killing people, and so is Oliver, he's not the same person you met when you first met him, he does not want to be a murderer, I came to assist a friend, I don't care about the league and would not kill myself attempting to destroy it, I'm sure there's still a lot of the world I don't know about, you and Oliver must be good friends if you're risking getting into trouble with my father, but why come to me, Talia inquired, the only way to settle this is if we take the fight to Ra's al Ghul and someone else takes up his mantle, Naruto replied, startling Talia. 
because even if I assist Oliver in dealing with the League members Ra's dispatches to Starling, that will not solve the problem. Even if Oliver accepts the offer, Starling will be sentenced to death. You can succeed me as the League of Assassins next leader if you help Oliver and I stop Ra's Al Ghul. Talia looked at him with intrigue as he made his proposal. Talia mumbled, interesting, as the two of them walked around the abbey, you have my full attention. My strategy is to have Oliver infiltrate the League in order to gain Ra's trust. Bruce informed me of the League's more suggestive methods for their members, but I can devise a countermeasure. Oliver gets his trust and discovers Eve. Ra's Al Ghul does not desire the title, but he is skilled and determined to combat him in any way he can. Talia chastised him, not exactly a well-laid plan, but Naruto simply shrugged. Naruto remarked, but he could see he wasn't doing everything he could to win her over. I'm the one with the least knowledge of the League. Oliver is the one who has fought him, and he is also your father. I'm not saying it'll be simple, but it might work. I believed you'd be able to help because you're the eldest Al Ghul and it affects your father. I know that's a lot to ask, but I wouldn't be here or have asked Bruce if I didn't believe it was doable. Interesting thinking, Talia said, but why would I help you and Oliver against my own father? Again, you two aren't exactly on each other's Christmas card list, and you know him better than almost anyone, Naruto said. Consider it a means to confront your past and claim your rightful place as the demon's successor. Instead of being here in Tibet and escaping from your past, I decided it had to signify something. Fathers frequently force us into terrible situations, but it is our responsibility to overcome them. I have a favor to ask of you. A favor? Talia asked. What could you possibly do for me? Said Naruto as he hurried up behind her. Talia felt the wind wash by her as she watched Naruto vanish in a burst of lightning and then return behind her. If he had intended to kill her right then and there, neither she nor her followers could have stopped him. He could easily have marched in and murdered everyone, but he chose not to, he was powerful. Naruto reassured her, there's a lot I can do that you and your father could only dream of doing. If Talia had been skeptical of his tactics before, she was now interested. So, are you in or are you out? As they resumed their chat, Talia took Naruto to get some dinner, stating, I'm still deciding. You are constantly surprising me. Let us continue this conversation. Come with me. Four hours later. When Naruto exited the monastery, Jiraiya was seated on the ground with a tiny impromptu fire, a tent set up, and a little pot of coffee brewing. He appeared to be having fun as he sipped his coffee and wrote notes in his notebook. Are you having fun, old man? Naruto inquired rhetorically. Very much so, Jiraiya said as she poured Naruto another cup of coffee. So, how did it turn out in there? He was happy with the debate with Talia's students, adding, by the way, thanks for doing nothing and leaving. Jiraiya laughed, and Naruto responded, happy to. What was the point of having you come with me if you're just gonna walk out when the fighting starts? Naruto wondered. You didn't need me, son, Jiraiya said, eliciting a glare from Naruto. You'd be fine with it. I believed in you. Besides, I have a feeling Talia would have preferred to speak with you alone. So, how did things go? That's good, because I didn't hear any more fighting and you're still alive. In a way. I'm hoping it works, but first I need to talk to Oliver. Prepare yourself, we're returning to civilization, Naruto said. Jiraiya said, sounds good to me, xxxxx line break. April 2015 The city of Starling City to say that things in Starling became difficult quickly would be an understatement. Oliver's rejection of Ra's offer triggered a chain reaction throughout the city. Ra's swiftly began dressing up as the arrow and killing the city's criminals in an attempt to turn the city and the police against him. He was previously celebrated as a hero of the city, but he quickly reverted to being a crook. And now that Captain Lance was no longer on his side, he had no pals in the city. Things became even worse when a League member dressed up at the Arrow assassinated the mayor, several city officials, and injured Ray Palmer. Captain Lance quickly issued an arrest warrant for the Arrow and reactivated the anti-vigilante task force. At the time, Oliver and his crew were getting ready to face the League. With Nissa's assistance, they discovered that the League was using Magnuson Plaza as a safe house and staging area while in town. Dig was to stand guard with a sniper while Oliver, Laurel, and Roy engaged the League. Dig kept an eye on everything while Oliver, Laurel, and Roy finished cleaning up. We've scoped out every floor, and so far nothing, Roy explained to Oliver. The parking garage is the same, Laurel added. Diggle, Oliver called out over his comm connection. Dig informed him, Northside is clear. Do you think Nissa played us? Roy inquired, and Oliver was at a loss for words when Dig phoned him. Hold on, I got movement. Upper level, southwest corner, Dig said as they rapidly made their way up to the roof parking level, where numerous League members, including Oliver's former comrade Maceo, were waiting. 
Maceo caught Oliver's shot and flung it to the ground before unsheathing his blade. Kill them all, says the narrator. The members of the league drew their weapons and charged forward. Roy shot two arrows, striking one of the assassins in the chest. When Laurel let out her canary cry, the supersonic shockwave drove two assassins flying and caused the remainder to cover their ears in anguish. Oliver took advantage of this and assaulted Maceo, striking him in the face and chest before Maceo fought back. Laurel and Roy fought together against the other league members, which was simple because they were dazed from her canary cry. Oliver took Maceo's sword from his grasp before hitting him in the gut and performing a leg sweep. When he heard applauding, he shot an arrow at his head and adjusted his aim to see Roz himself enter into view. Clearly, I made the right choice in selecting you as my heir, Roz said, motioning his followers to step down. Killing me will only win you the mantle you reject. It'll put a stop to you. I have legions who live only to see my will done. No, boy. You have only two choices. Ascend to the calling of Raz al Ghul or spend the rest of your days in a cage, Raz said. You're not going to imprison me, Oliver stated. No, I'm. Raz's sentence was cut off when a flashbang erupted in front of him, forcing Oliver, Roy, and Laurel to protect their eyes. The flashbang they were hit with was more potent than anything Oliver had used or been hit with, concussing and blinding him for 60 seconds. When he arrived, he noticed Raz and his league followers had left. Dig, where'd they go? Oliver exclaimed but received no response, dig. Soon, a police helicopter hovered over them, a spotlight shining down on them, and multiple police cars, SWAT vans, and an army of police officers, including Captain Lance, arrived. This is the Starling City Police, put your weapons down and your hands up, you are all under arrest. On the ground. Get on the ground, Lance yelled, only to see all the SCPD officers vanish one by one. He was then snatched away and found himself back at the SCPD station with everyone else. They were all perplexed by what had just occurred. They were on the rooftop moments ago, preparing to arrest the vigilantes, but have now returned to the SCPD. Something damaged the police helicopter searchlight, making it impossible for them to see anything, and then Oliver, Laurel, and Roy were taken away and reappeared in the bunker. Oliver closed his eyes and shook his head as he came down from the whiplash, while Roy and Laurel hunched over with nausea and fought not to throw up. You know, if I end up saving your butts every time I visit this city, I should start charging you guys. They heard Naruto smirking in Felicity's chair, while Dig sat on a chair with his head in a dumpster. I really mean it. I could make some nice spending money. That was you? Roy inquired, and Naruto nodded. Laurel inquired, were you watching us? Not exactly. I came to Starling to talk to Oliver, but there was no one here, so I did some digging, which led me to the roof of that parking garage. Good thing I showed up. Or you guys would still be playing keep away with the cops, Naruto observed. Don't worry about the cops, they're all back at the SCPD, baffled as to what happened but still alive, with some probably suffering from whiplash and nausea like Dig. Dig puked a little more before emerging from the garbage can, where Naruto offered him a bottle of water and some gum. Thank you, Dig said. And Roz? Oliver inquired. He and his followers are taking a little swim right now, about a hundred miles off the Pacific coast, give or take a mile or two, Naruto explained. You dropped them off in the middle of the ocean? Laurel inquired. No, just a hundred miles off the coast. I would have liked to drop them off in the middle of the ocean, but it would have taken longer, and I figured with everything going down, I needed to race back, plus factoring in the league members I had to carry, it seemed good enough, Naruto said, causing everyone to exhale a sigh of relief. Even though he is Ra's al Ghul, I have a feeling it will be a while before you hear back from him if they aren't eaten by sharks. Thank you for your help, Oliver remarked as Naruto rose up and shook his hand. Don't bring it up, Naruto said, smiling. Oliver observed, you're looking better. I am. I am doing a lot better. Some time in a trip to Gotham gave me some much needed clarity and healing. I've been on the sidelines for a while, but Impulse is back and just in time by the looks of it, Naruto replied, looking at the news on the computers. So, this is how Raz handles rejection. You'd think a man his age would have some wisdom and learn how to handle rejection. Yup, you're back, Dig confirmed. So, Oliver, what's the plan? Naruto's bought us some time, but not a lot. I'd say give or take a week before they show up again, and that's being generous, Naruto said. I underestimated Raz. I thought if we stopped Maceo, we'd be able to stop this, but this goes beyond him, and we're paying the price, Oliver explained. You'll come up with something, I've run some interference, and the league is temporarily incapacitated. That'll give you some time to plan your next move, Naruto remarked. Can Oliver and I talk for a minute please? Sure. I'll check in with Lila. 
She may no longer be working with Argus, but she might be able to help, Dig suggested. Roy said, I'll go check in with Thea, and I'll go talk to my dad, Laurel added as they all left, leaving Naruto and Oliver alone. I'm sorry for having them leave, but I thought it would be best if we talked alone, Naruto explained. What exactly is it? Oliver inquired, it wasn't just Star Labs business and personal healing I was doing since we last spoke. I've been trying to figure out how to help you deal with the League and aside from the obvious intervention I just played I got some help from a friend in Gotham. He led me to an old acquaintance of yours in Tibet. Naruto said, which only confused Oliver. The woman who helped you in Russia and turned you into the hood. Talia. Oliver wasn't sure where this was headed. Why did you go to see her? Because she can help. Her full name is Talia Al Ghul. She's Ra's eldest daughter and was supposed to be his heir, but as you can guess, that didn't work out. Naruto explained. Look, whatever you're about to say about how dangerous this is, you can save it. If a friend is running headlong into a fight, then I'm right alongside him. Besides, with Talia's help, we might be able to stop her father, I have a plan. A plan? Oliver inquired. A rough outline of a plan, but it could work, it won't be easy, but it's something, Naruto explained to Oliver. There was some idea bouncing and insane thinking, but after a few hours, they had a strategy, only time would tell if it worked. Naruto exited the bunker and entered the alley behind Verdant, where Jiraiya awaited him. Jiraiya inquired, so, what did Oliver say? After some explaining, arguing, and theorizing, we finally have a plan. Oliver knows his part, and I know mine. Only time will tell if it will work, Naruto stated, noticing Jiraiya's bag, is that everything? Yeah, everything I'm going to need for your other plan and everything else is in place, Jiraiya replied. Do you really think it'll come to that? Jiraiya questioned. Naruto replied, don't you? Jiraiya nodded, are you okay with doing this? Yeah, I figured it was the least I could do for Oliver for doing such a good job training and assisting you. It's not like it'll be the first time I've done this, and as much fun as it's been hanging out with you kid, after I help Oliver. Yeah, you gotta go. Keep doing what you're good at, traveling the world, taking down bad guys, and tracking down our next lead on the Nine, Sasori and Didera, Naruto stated. Thanks for sticking around for as long as you have. It's nice to relax and enjoy myself every now and then, and having fun on your crazy adventures was definitely a hallmark moment, Jiraiya said as Naruto smiled. Naruto then hugged Jiraiya, who paused for a minute in surprise before smiling and hugging his godson back. I'm gonna miss you, kid. I'm going to miss you, Naruto said, pulling away from the hug. Remember, if you need anything, just let me know, and don't wait too long before your next visit. I've grown accustomed to having my godfather around. I will. If only to hit on your hot landlady, Jiraiya said, rolling his eyes. Stay safe, kid. Likewise, old perv. Naruto and Jiraiya hugged one more time before the elderly spy and the quick metahuman parted ways, but their paths would meet again. City center Naruto exited the central city airport with his luggage and took a taxi back to Star Laboratories. As he went out of the airport, he noticed that many news outlets were covering the new Star Labs arrangement with Wayne Enterprises. Wall Street experts and corporate executives were predicting a lucrative alliance. Wayne Enterprises' global reach would effectively aid in the development of Star Laboratories' technology on a larger scale and in a much shorter timescale. With the inclusion of an arc reactor being created in Gotham and the reveal of Star Labs' man-made tantalum element Starium. It's safe to say that Wall Street executives and Wayne Enterprises' stockholders were overjoyed. Although the discovery of Starium caused a minor ripple in the technology industry, it was mostly felt by enterprises mining and developing tantalum in China, Africa, and South America. With the discovery of a man-made element that could accomplish everything tantalum could do but be created in a lab, their stocks were suffering. How swiftly they fell would be determined by time. Naruto arrived at Star Labs, relieved to be back. Before going to see Linda, he'd check in with the others in the Cortex. He overheard the others discussing something as he strolled over to the Cortex. Joe, Barry, Sisko, Caitlin, and Dr. Wells were coping with the appearance of the trickster, a copycat maniac who has been terrorizing Central City with terrorist threats. His most recent scheme resulted in the escape of the original trickster, James Jesse, and the kidnapping of Barry's father, Henry Allen. We were able to identify the other trickster. His name is Axel Walker, and he and James have apparently been corresponding via snail mail for over a decade, Joe revealed. I should have been there, Barry murmured, cursing himself for his father's death as Caitlin walked over to console him. We'll find your father, okay, Caitlin promised him. Certainly, Sisko added. As Naruto stepped into the cortex with his baggage, they heard him say, absolutely. Didn't I pick a good time to return? 
Maruto. Caitlin approached him and hugged him, and he hugged back. When did you get back? I landed a little while ago and came over soon after, which is a good thing because I'll be able to help, Naruto explained. Sisko said, glad to have you back, man. Don't worry, Barry, Joe reassured him, we'll get him back. Right, guess I should have listened to you, Barry remarked to Dr. Wells as he stood up and walked away. It's not the welcome we had hoped for you, Naruto, but it's good to have you back, Dr. Wells said. Good to see you again, Dr. Wells, don't worry, we'll have the party after Barry's father returns safely, Naruto answered. Why did you return late? Gara showed up a week ago, and he just said you were taking care of some other business, Caitlin asked, drawing Joe's attention. Yeah, I had some extra things to take care of. I'll explain later. Catch me up. Naruto remarked as they filled him in on the trickster situation they've been dealing with. The trickster. Could have chosen a better name, but that's beside the point. Anyhow, if I'm going to help Barry, I need to get a suit ready. Sisko informed him, I've got a spare impulse suit ready in the workshop. Thank you, Sisko, but I've got an idea for a new suit, Naruto said as he began working. XXXXX line break later that night, at City Hall, a charity banquet was being organized to honor Mayor Bellows. The elite of Central City, as well as the journalists, were present for the typical handshaking and such. Iris and Linda were on their way to cover the story. Iris was dressed in a scarlet gown, while Linda was dressed in a gorgeous black and white gown. Naruto was probably right about Linda looking good in black and white. They checked in with the party organizer just as a man with a tray of champagne approached. Champagne, please, ladies, thank you, they said, raising their glasses and cheering before taking a taste. They had no idea their waiter was the trickster, James Jesse in disguise. Axel Walker then approached in disguise as another waiter. We're almost out of champagne. Then the fun begins, James Jesse said, smirking. Linda and Iris strolled around and chatted with some of the guesses. I imagine that with you dating Naruto, this is going to become somewhat normal. What, covering these charity events? Linda asked, I do that all the time when we're short a reporter. I mean the whole charity gala, handshaking thing, Iris remarked as Linda laughed. I think I'll be able to enjoy them a little more if I'm not working, Linda replied as one of the servers approached the podium. Welcome, welcome, Central City's finest. How about a toast to Mayor Anthony Bellows? He doesn't just yell at his staff, he bellows, he quipped, eliciting laughter from the audience. See what I did there with the wordplay and the dot egg, tough crowd? Mayor Bellows went up and covered the microphone, saying, Excuse me, who exactly are you? How quickly they forget, James Jesse, your honor aka, Jesse removed his wig and glasses, messed up his hair, and walked away. Dot the trickster, and I'm here to relieve you fine people of all your money, because we know you've got a lot of it if you're in this room. Axel pulled out an assault rifle with a grenade launcher attached and aimed it towards the terrified throng. What makes you think that anyone in this room would give you a cent? Mayor Bellows inquired because that champagne they just slurped down like so much fruit punch, I added a little something special to it. Trimethylmercury 32. Poison. You'll begin to feel the effects in about, oh. Um, one hour. Trickster announced as one of the guests began to foam at the mouth and stagger. Oh, I remember you. You arrived about an hour early and I offered you the first glass of champagne. Before collapsing to the ground, the man retched up some vomit and foam. An hour is plenty of time for all of you to call your bankers and transfer everything you have to the account number on the bottom of your glass. Once my young friend and I are rich, you'll get the antidote. If any of you decide to call 911 instead, well. Then we move on to lead poisoning. Linda and Iris had their phones out and were gently calling for assistance. Linda clicked the emergency button, which sent a distress signal to Star Labs, while Iris dialed her father's phone number. Speaking of Star Labs, Team Flash was still having trouble finding the trickster. Naruto was working on his new suit in the next workshop when an alarm went off. What's that? Sisko inquired as Naruto hurried over and pushed him to the side of the room so he could use the computer. That's Linda's panic button. I installed it on her phone to send a signal to Star Labs if something went wrong. Naruto explained as he checked on Linda's whereabouts, she's down at City Hall. Soon later, Joe's phone rang, and he answered it, but it wasn't Iris. He turned on the speaker, and they could all hear the trickster explain about the poison he used. That's him, Jesse, Barry remarked. I'm pinging her phone, Naruto stated, tracking Iris's whereabouts with the Star Lab satellite. Caitlin looked it up and told them, trimethylmercury-32 is a relatively fast-acting poison. Is there a cure? Questioned Barry. Dr. Wells informed him, yes, we can start synthesizing the antidote right now. I got it. 
Iris is at City Hall, just like Linda, Naruto explained. Joe stated as Barry approached his suit, the mayor's having a fundraiser there tonight. Do not underestimate the trickster, Barry, Dr. Wells warned, only for Barry to vanish in an instant. I'll get to work on the antidote. Naruto dashed to the biolab and started synthesizing the antidote as rapidly as he could while still finishing his suit. When the Flash arrived at City Hall, he pushed Jesse against the wall in rage, what happened to Henry Allen? He's going to be where you'll be soon. Heaven. Axel swiftly fastened a device to the Flash's left wrist. Are you familiar with the movie Speed? Keanu Reeves, Sandra Bullock. See, you're the bus, and that's the bomb. A kinetic bomb, actually, and if you go slower than 600 miles per hour, it explodes, and the same thing happens if you try to remove it. After that, Axel flipped a switch, and the bomb began to beep. Ooh, it's active. Run, 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 cackled the trickster as the flash dashed away and began racing across the city. Back at the cortex, Dr. Wells, Cisco, and Caitlin were attempting to solve their new dilemma, the explosive strapped to Barry's arm. You guys figure out how to get that thing off of Barry, and I'll handle the trickster. You've got the antidote, all right? Cisco couldn't complete his sentence as a silver blur rushed by them all in a gust of wind considerably stronger than they were used to. The blur rushed through Central City before arriving at City Hall and injected the antidote into every single patron. Jesse and Axel looked up to see a crimson and white blur rush through the crowd at breakneck speed before stopping in front of them. Everyone could witness the new speedster who came to their aid with their own eyes. Black boots with red shin highlights, black jeans, and a belt containing numerous tools and gadgets. The majority of his outfit was silver from the waist up, except for his crimson gloves, forearms, and accents around his biceps, ribs, and collarbones. His mask covered the majority of his head save for his mouth and hair, and he wore crimson wingtips on his ears and goggles on his forehead. To top it all off, a sign of a scarlet lightning bolt in a gear completed the picture. 1. Don't worry, everyone, you've all been given an antidote, he exclaimed as he held up a serum injector. That wasn't very sanitary. Give it up, trickster. It's over, Naruto said allowing Axel to fire his assault rifle. He unleashed a hail of bullets, but something incredible happened as Naruto moved his left arm in a flash. The audience screamed and ducked as Axel continued to fire until the clip in Naruto's assault rifle was empty and he stopped moving his arm. Everyone, including the tricksters, could see that he was okay, and nothing seemed to happen as if the gun had been loaded with blanks until Naruto opened his hand and dropped 30 rounds to the ground. You obviously haven't been paying attention to the news if you thought bullets would work on a speedster. Before either trickster could react, Naruto charged forward, shoulder-checked Axel in the gut, and slammed him against a wall with a tremendous crash. He pushed Jess's face into the podium before twisting his arm behind his back. Are you going to give up now, or am I going to have to break your arm? Hey, since when do heroes get this violent? Jesse inquired, only for Naruto to twist his wrist. This hero does. You lost, trickster. Naruto took out a pair of zip cuffs and shackled his hand together when they heard a whoosh and the flash emerged. Oh, it looks like you're zero for two tonight. It's over, trickster. Now find Henry Allen. You're going to jail either way, Flash remarked, leaving Jesse to groan as he told them where his hostage was. When the cops arrived, Naruto surrendered Jesse and Axel to them. As Naruto waved back, bystanders began taking pictures and cheering. Thank you for everything, the mayor said, but who are you? As everyone took pictures and videos, Naruto murmured, Impulse. If you're Impulse, why do you look so different? Iris questioned. I made myself a new suit because it felt like it was time for a change, and just so everyone knows, I'm not the Flash's sidekick. I'm his partner, he explained before winking at Linda. Get home safely, everyone, and I'll see you later. He sped out of there in a blur and made his way back to Star Labs, leaving everyone awestruck. At least it wasn't boring tonight, Linda said, leading Iris to giggle. Barry spotted his father and saved him before a dangling box of blades turned him into Swiss cheese. To the team's amazement, Barry's father recognized him as the Flash. Barry dropped him off at Star Labs to be cared for and given some time before being returned to Iron Heights. In awe, Henry Allen peered about the cortex of Star Labs. Wow! So, this is what it looks like inside a company trying to revolutionize the world. Even in prison, we've been hearing all about Star Labs, but I still can't believe it. Half of this stuff didn't even exist when I was practicing. Yeah, well, I'd be happy to give you a crash course on everything if you get out, Cisco responded, realizing what he had just said. I'm going to stop talking now. It's all right, Henry reassured him. Dr. Allen? I feel the need to hug you, Caitlin exclaimed. Absolutely, 
I will always accept a hug, thank you, Henry said as the two hugged. That's when he noticed the two mannequins on the wall holding the flash and impulse suits. He walked over and stared in wonder at his son. Wow, you've got to tell me what it's like running down the street like a bat out of hell. Barry smiled before turning to face Dr. Wells, there's no other feeling like it. I bet. Actually, you're all heroes in my books, especially you, Dr. Wells. Thank you for everything you've done for my son. Henry remarked as he shook Dr. Wells' hand. Well, your son is an extraordinary man, Dr. Allen, Dr. Wells comforted him as Henry looked over at Barry. Naruto then approached Barry and patted him on the shoulder. And I'll make sure he's safe out there in the city, because that's what partners are for, Naruto promised him. Thank you, Henry said as he and Barry hugged one last time, it's that time, Joe. Joe nodded but did not handcuff Henry as he escorted him out of Star Labs. While Team Flash had won, it was bittersweet because Henry was being returned to prison, but there was still hope that they may get him back. Caitlin approached Barry and hugged him. You seem like you could use a hug, too, she said as she walked over to the medical lab. Your father is a remarkable man, and you are fortunate to have him, Dr. Wells stated. I'm fortunate to have you as well, Barry remarked as he shook Dr. Wells' hand. On the surface, everything appeared to be fine, but it wasn't, he quickly left to attend to some business. Naruto smiled as he approached the mannequin wearing his suit, it felt fantastic to be out there again. Dr. Wells stated as he walked over, an impressive suit. However, I'm intrigued by the color change. I guess you could say I saw it in a dream, Naruto explained, and I needed a change. This is the new me, and this is the new impulse, and it was a lot of fun making a new suit. Yeah, fun you left out, dude, Sisko replied as he approached. I'd be even angrier with you if I didn't like the new suit. A composite material? It's a reinforced tri-polymer composite material like Barry's suit, but I added a lightweight Kevlar weave as well to make it bulletproof, and there's an intricate inbuilt sensor system to monitor vitals and stuff like that. I was going to add an inbuilt HUD system into the cowl, but I ran out of time, Naruto explained. Then next time, Dr. Wells joked. Oh, Cisco, before I forget, Naruto said, pulling out a little Polaroid photograph and handing it to him, here. Cisco took it and became wide-eyed before passing out, he would have hit his head on the ground if Naruto hadn't swooped in and caught him mid-fall. Oh my god, Sisko, Caitlin exclaimed as Naruto lifted him and brought him to a gurney. Relax, he's fine. He just fainted, Naruto reassured her as he put Sisko to sleep. Why did he faint? Caitlin inquired as Naruto displayed the photograph to her. Oh, my god. The image was taken at the Batcave during Naruto's collaboration with Batman. He must have taken it at super speed because it clearly showed Batman, Robin, and Nightwing, and none of them seemed to notice a photograph being taken. Yeah. I took it super fast. I figured Cisco would want some details, but I figured a photo would be a cool souvenir. He can keep it, but remind him that if he shows it to anyone or advertises this to anyone, I'll kill him," Naruto said as he placed the photograph on a table. Duly noted, Caitlin informed him as she kept an eye on Cisco as Naruto went to see Gara. Gara remained in Central City, working on Naruto's assigned work floor. After their Gotham excursion, the sand-controlling metahuman was very busy as head of Star Lab's hour, and that would only increase with time if things continued as they were. Naruto entered Gara's new office, which had been promptly outfitted with furniture, computers, a phone system, a holographic workstation, a television, and everything else he needed for his profession. He was currently typing on the computer while the holographic workstation displayed some documents for him to review. Naruto observed, hard at work, I see. When Gara looked up, he noticed Naruto standing at the doorway. Well, I've got a lot of work to do now. If Star Labs is going to be a real company, that means I have a real job," Gara said as she stood up and hugged him tightly. Glad you're still alive. So, am I how's everything been? Naruto inquired. I've spoken with Dr. Wells and Star Labs attorneys, and I'm going over all the old legal paperwork, contracts, and things of that nature to make sure they're all updated," Gara said. For the time being, his time as Godfather is over, he had to return to work, but I have a feeling we'll see him again," Naruto vowed. As for assistance, I'm here to assist you, but expanding Star Labs will have to wait until the secondary site in the city is established. I can't risk exposing the team to regular workers coming in and out of the building, especially since we have a pipeline filled with evil metahumans. You make a valid point. I figured enough people already knew about you and Barry, Gara said. True. However, Star Labs has enough capital to begin expanding. I've already heard from Lucius, and Wayne Enterprises is already in negotiations with the US Department of Defense to manufacture our body armor. 
Then there's the slew of modest deals with police departments across the country, as well as our ICERs, not to mention the holographic workstation blueprints, which will go into production in a month. Furthermore, the oxohydrin bacteria is already being employed to battle pollution. Star Labs is producing enough money to start growing, much alone compensate you and the others. I've already purchased a large warehouse near the commercial district to serve as the site of the first Star Labs expansion. We'll have everyone work out of there. They'll start construction there in a month, Naruto revealed. I've even gotten emails from the board of directors at Stag Industries hoping Star Labs will inquire about purchasing controlling interests in the company. Nice planning. Gara said as Naruto handed him the paperwork for everything, including his payment, though it's more work for me. You will not be alone in this, I'll be there to assist, and perhaps we'll be able to hire some other folks to assist as well, which will be your duty. In that case, we'll need to undertake some recruitment. Any suggestions? Naruto was perplexed. Well, there are some old friends in New York who might be willing to sign on with Star Labs, but as you mentioned, they won't be working until the Star Labs expansion is completed. I can still make some calls, Gara suggested. That sounds wonderful to me. Let's get to work, Naruto stated as he and Gara set the basis for what Star Labs would become, which was a lot of labor. XXXXX line break It had been almost a week since the whole Trickster incident and the appearance of the brand new Impulse. Both Trickster old and new were arrested and sent to jail, the money they took was returned, and all the patrons were fine. After that, it was relatively calm except for the crazy night of crime which Barry was able to handle with Joe. Other than that, there wasn't much to talk about. Naruto worked with Dr. Wells, Sisko, Caitlin, and Gara to get everything ready for Star Labs expansion. A lot of it was logistical stuff, but mostly it dealt with local orders like finishing the orders for the CCPD with their icers and body armor. Star Labs pretty much became one of the massive donors to the CCPD and began upgrading all their equipment, workspace, and other things. Captain Singh joked they would soon be the envy of police departments all over. More good news. The oxohydrin bacteria was tested at central city dumps and landfills, and all of the toxic rubbish was dissolved and converted into oxohydrin gas within two days, helping to improve air quality and reduce pollution. It was a big success, and Gardiner Lake would soon be treated. In addition, Naruto was working on the Star Labs monitoring station on the roof of Star Labs. Soon, oxohydrin treatments would be used across the country, reducing pollutants and bringing us one step closer to saving the globe. Not only that, but Naruto was attempting to collaborate with Central City Hospital in order to sponsor new medical treatments for diseases like as cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and a variety of others. With all of the positive news, there was speculation that Star Labs would be awarded the Nobel Prize for their work. That was a wonderful notion, but Dr. Wells reminded them all that science is about the joy of discovery and helping others, not becoming a prima donna on the news and getting prizes. Cisco pointed out that there's nothing wrong with giving out awards, Nonetheless, Star Labs' collaboration with Wayne Enterprises in developing and distributing their patents freed them up to work on other projects, allowing Naruto to finally pay Sisko, Caitlin, and Gara their salaries. Gara utilized the money to hunt for an apartment in the city, but first he traveled to Fresh York City and Los Angeles to conduct business, such as recruiting fresh talent and reopening the old Manhattan and Los Angeles research departments. Star Laboratories used to have facilities and warehouses in other cities, but with the explosion of the particle accelerator, the other branches began to close down. The Manhattan and Los Angeles branches were closed, but the buildings remained, making it an easy step to convert those locations into research labs for the corporation. He'd be gone for some time, two weeks in Manhattan for business to start looking for new hires and checking into the old facility before heading to Los Angeles to do the same. Naruto also advised him to take some time off to unwind. Tamari and Konkuro would meet him for a family vacation in Los Angeles, but they might also relocate to Central City. They were quite interested in job chances with Star Labs. Gara would take care of it. Naruto also caught up on what he had missed while away. The entire Weather Wizard problem, including Captain Cold and Heatwave. Weather Wizard was secure in the pipeline, but they were at odds with Captain Cold, who had discovered who Barry was. They'd have to tread carefully with him, but he'd also learned that Barry and Eno had split up. Barry reportedly liked Eno a lot, but his heart didn't hurt for her, Eno guessed it and wasn't furious because she knew his heart was set on Iris, which led to him trying to tell Iris how he truly felt. That went approximately as expected. Badly, but Caitlin rescued his buttocks. Still, it was strange, and everyone noticed that Barry was acting strange and out of character. Naruto can only hope that it wasn't something horrible. Naruto, Caitlin, Sisko, and Dr. Wells were all working on various jobs in the Cortex. Caitlin was hard at work in the medical lab, 
designing alpha tests on therapies, which were essentially initial ideas for future testing. Dr. Wells was using the ARC reactor to create additional sterium. They'd already shipped two large truckloads to Gotham, totaling approximately a thousand pounds, so the next scheduled shipment for refining and processing would be a while. Cisco was working on ARC reactor energy applications and generating rough drawings for ARC reactor batteries, while Naruto was juggling projects, logistical paperwork, and patent filing with their legal team at Weathersby and Stone. Dr. Wells quipped that given everything they'd be doing, they might have to hire Weathersby and Stone full-time as Star Labs' legal team. This would also help because Naruto was planning to establish the Star Labs Foundation, a charitable organization and fund where revenues would be donated to worthy causes. Once again, a lot of labor. He was currently using the holographic workstation to create various items for their superhero, vigilante team and pals. He'd already set up folders for himself, Barry, Oliver, Roy, Laurel, Diggle, Vixen, and Batman. Naruto was honestly envious of what Bruce had developed to become Gotham City's Dark Knight after witnessing the Batcave. As a result, he began creating his own enhancements for Bruce to use. That's when he observed Sisko looking him down. Is there anything I can do for you, Sisko? Naruto inquired, noting Sisko's face of both curiosity and a desperate need for information. Come on, dude. What was he like? Sisko inquired, only to hear Naruto sigh in tiredness. Sisko has asked this question a hundred times. Sisko, I can't tell you anything for the hundredth time and counting, Naruto reminded him. Come on, dude. You had a trip to Gotham where you not only met Batman, but you also teamed up with him, Nightwing, and Robin against some of his greatest supervillains. You can't expect me not to ask questions, Sisko said. Oh, I expected this, but as I said, I can't say anything because I already told you too much about what happened with Roulette. Batman was very specific that he didn't want me saying anything, and I'm taking that promise to heart, Naruto responded. I don't want to piss off Batman. What was his suit like? Was it a hardened Kevlar fiber suit or more of a plating kind of situation like a knight? What about Nightwing? Come on, give me something on the Batmobile, Sisko pleaded. Caitlin, can you help? Naruto inquired. Caitlin returned to work, saying, I'm not touching this one with a 10-foot pole. How about his computer system? What was it like? Sisko inquired. Dr. Wells? pleaded Naruto. Dr. Wells smirked, leaving Naruto to deal with a beseeching Sisko. I'm sorry, Sisko, but I can't tell you anything, Naruto stated as Sisko approached to see what he was working on, only to be pushed to the side. That includes not showing you what I'm designing for him. When they heard footsteps and saw Barry stroll in, Sisko exclaimed, Oh, boo you. Hey, Barry. Thank God, Barry, Naruto exclaimed, grateful that someone had arrived to stop Sisko. Please inform me that something has occurred and that we have a task to complete. Something has happened, and we have a job to do, Barry explained as he told them about their next odd situation. Lindsay Kong, a Hudson University professor, died. She was discovered dead in her automobile, with hundreds of puncture wounds indicating anaphylaxis. Caitlin ran the information and data collected by Barry and discovered the culprit. Apotoxin death, Caitlin explained. Dr. Wells was interested by the circumstance and replied, honeybee venom. That's an unusual choice for an attack, Naruto remarked when he observed Sisko wasn't looking so hot. Bees. Why did it have to be bees? Y'all, I don't do bees. Ain't nobody got time for bees. However, when a honeybee stings, the stingers are literally ripped from their abdomen, and they die, Dr. Wells hypothesized. But there were no stingers in the body, and there were no bees in the car, Barry explained. Caitlin explained, a honeybee can only deposit 0.1 milligrams of apotoxin when it releases its stinger. However, Ms. Kong was discovered with enough venom in her system to kill an elephant herd, implying that a metahuman is not only controlling these bees but also increasing their toxicity, Dr. Wells speculated. Or perhaps the metahuman was able to mutate the bees into a new breed, or it could be a metamorphic change like Kabuto, Naruto speculated. Bees communicate by releasing pheromones, perhaps this meta is controlling them via secretion, Barry speculated. The question is, how do we find this meta? replied Naruto. Anyone want to join me in getting a beekeeper suit? Sisko inquired. Barry informed him, I'm pretty sure Naruto and I can outrun a bee. Oh, just don't run into a lake. Felicity said as they approached her. Bees will wait for you to come up for air before stinging you. Discovery Channel. There's a lot to discover. Remind me to start working on the security system. We really need to get that thing fixed or else anyone can walk in, Naruto said quietly, and Dr. Wells nodded. Felicity, what are you doing here? inquired Barry. Is it Oliver? 
is Ra back? Naruto asked, making Barry glance at him strangely? No, not yet, and he's fine for now. Well, not fine, but as good as it can be. I'm actually here for another reason. Can you guys come outside for a sec? Felicity inquired. They were all gathered outside the Star Lab's side entrance with Felicity, wondering what they were waiting for. Felicity stated that all they had to do was wait. Dr. Wells inquired, what exactly are we waiting for, Ms. Smoke? Up there, Felicity said, pointing to the sky, where they could see something approaching. Is that a bird? It's an airplane. Soon after, the figure flew down in an erratic manner and landed with a loud thud on the pavement, cracking the concrete beneath its feet. The individual in question was a man dressed in a red and blue armored outfit. She informed them, it's my boyfriend. Ray Palmer was revealed when the figure removed his helmet. My name is Ray. Our world just keeps getting smaller, doesn't it? Naruto remarked as they led Ray into the cortex, where Caitlin checked him over to make sure he was okay as Dr. Wells and Sisko examined his suit. Naruto sat at the computer to finish some work when he heard Barry and Felicity talking, and it was clear he wasn't delighted she had arrived unexpectedly. Ray commented as he walked out of the medical lab, Ah, well, my ears popped, so that's something. You're lucky you didn't break your neck. What is it with billionaires being superheroes? Caitlin pondered. So, uh, have you picked out a name yet? Sisko inquired. I'm kind of partial to the atom, Ray said, fist collapsing and making a shrinking noise to emphasize his point, but Sisko wasn't convinced. You're married to that. Your ATOM suit is quite the technological achievement, Mr. Palmer, Dr. Wells said. Caitlin said, and he is rarely impressed. Well, thank you, but I can't seem to keep it up, Ray replied, eliciting strange eyes from everyone. He means the suit. Yeah, I mean the suit. Yeah, everything else works just fine. There's nothing we need to fix in, that area. No, 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 the sex is fantastic, Caitlin remarked, God, there's two of them. I know you've been very helpful with Barry in the flash suit, and I was hoping to get another set of eyes on my problem, Ray and Felicity eventually managed to put into words. Any friend of the arrow is a friend of, hold on, Dr. Wells, Naruto interrupted. I'm not sure if we should be assisting you. Caitlin chastised him, but he held out his hand and indicated for her to wait until he made his point. First and foremost, Barry has a point that you showed up unannounced, Felicity. Now, I love you, you know I do, but a little warning would have been nice, as well as a heads up that you told Ray who we are. Secret identities have a habit of keeping us safe, and considering our identities are at stake, it would have been nice to have a say in the matter, Naruto explained. Imagine how you'd feel if we'd told everyone you worked for the arrow without your knowledge, Granted, Barry did it, but that's beside the point. Felicity said, fair enough. Second, I'm a little concerned about assisting a business rival, especially since you brought the CEO of Palmer Technologies right into the heart of Star Labs, Naruto said. Well, I'm not exactly here as the CEO of Palmer Tech, but I swear I'm not going to look at anything I'm not supposed to. Scout's honor. You don't have to be afraid, Ray explained. Finally, I'm not sure we should be assisting you because you just try to arrest the arrow for being a vigilante when apparently you're trying to do the exact same thing, Naruto said. A little hypocritical if you ask me, and your pride almost got you mixed up with the League of Assassins, who would have turned that dwarf alloy suit into a paperweight if the arrow hadn't gotten you to back off. Suffice it to say, I'm a little concerned about helping you with your suit. After that, there was an awkward silence, although Naruto offered some reasonable comments. They were more than willing to assist, but Ray's appearance did cause some apprehension. Barry looked at Naruto and was surprised by his reaction. A lot had changed. Naruto makes some valid points, Ms. Smoke, would you like to argue your case? Dr. Wells inquired. True, Naruto, that everything you said is true, and I'm sorry. Guess I kind of forgot the basic manners with everything going on, but you're right. Next time, I swear I'll give you guys a heads up, and promise your secret is safe with me, I swear. Felicity pleaded. Yeah. After a rather painful conversation, Oliver pointed out exactly what you did. I was wrong, but I want to help people, so if you'll help me, I promise I won't waste your trust in me," Ray concluded. The crew exchanged a few glances before settling on Naruto, who appeared to have the unspoken last say on this matter. The problem with your suit is the operating temperature. The oxide fuel cells in the belt overheat and throw the system into flux, most likely due to damage from your fight with the arrow. If you want to actually use your atom suit, You'll need to insulate your suit and the fuel cells with a ceramic cobalt resin, which will improve the operating efficiency while maintaining power to weight ratio. Naruto explained as Ray looked at the suit and did some quick mental calculations. You're right, Ray remarked, making the team laugh. Sisko joked, 
Naruto's super genius brain for the win. If you want to use that suit, I'd work on it first, but honestly, those oxide cells should be thrown out. If you want something efficient, go for an ionic charging reaction with the dwarf star alloy's potential energy properties. If you work it right, that suit can generate all the energy you need without excess batteries or things like that. Granted, it'll take some time, but that's where you'll want to go with the suit. Naruto explained, effectively melting rays despite all of his efforts, Naruto was able to solve a problem that had been bothering him for weeks in a matter of minutes. Naruto laughed and tapped the side of his head. You are a genius, and Sisko can assist you. Totally, Sisko said, eager to go to work on the suit. Whoa, guys. I don't need to remind you, but we kind of have our own problem to deal with. A metahuman killer who can control a whole hive of mutated killer bees? Barry reminded them. Cool, Ray remarked until he saw Felicity's expression. I mean, awful. I'm sure Caitlin, Naruto, and I will be there to help you, Barry, Dr. Wells said. And I'll gladly sit this one out, Sisko added. Felicity realized Barry was acting strangely and decided to give them some space. Ray, why don't you stay here and work on those upgrades Naruto told you about while Barry and I run to jitters for some java? Ray and Sisko got to work, saying, sounds like a plan. Coffee? Felicity inquired. Sure, Barry said as he and Felicity walked away. Naruto and Dr. Wells giving them strange stares. Wasn't that strange? Naruto inquired. Dr. Wells informed Naruto, at this point, I believe Odd is just part of Barry's personality. While Naruto, Caitlin, and Dr. Wells worked on their new meta killer, Ray and Sisko brought the Atom suit to the speedster trap room because it housed the equipment they needed to work on the upgrades. Naruto, on the other hand, was multitasking while also assisting with the meta killer. For the win, speedster brain. He was poring over the data on their victim, and she appeared to be a perfectly regular scientist. Engineering professor at Hudson University with a loving husband who was devastated to learn what transpired. Previous employment history at Mercury Laboratories, where she worked for their robotic engineering team, but not even a smudge or mention of a police report. And the fact that it happened in her car indicated that someone was aware of her routines. An alarm went off before they could go any deeper. What's that? Caitlin said as Naruto checked the computers and discovered that it was coming from the CCPD feed. There have been reports of killer bees at Folston Tech. Another bee attack at Folston Tech. Contact Barry. Naruto grabbed his suit and dashed out of Star Labs. When he arrived at Folston Tech, he saw everyone hurrying out of the building, so he went up to the third floor to an office where the victim was. Soon after, Barry arrived and spotted the victim as well. It's too late, Flash stated over the radio. Where are the bees? inquired Sisko. When they heard a little buzzing noise, Impulse said, no sign of them here. Looks like they're gone. A closer inspection revealed a small bee crawling out of the victim's mouth and flying into the air. What the hell? Then a swarm of bees flew out of his mouth, nose, and ears, filling the office in a sight that looked like it belonged in a horror film. Found them, Flash shouted as he and Impulse sped away, the bees pursuing them in an ordered and precise manner. Split up, Impulse exclaimed as they followed opposing ways down a corridor, but the bees divided up and chased them. How do I get out of here? Yelled Flash as Sisko performed some simulations to figure out a path. Take the northeast crossway, it's the quickest way out of the building, Sisko said. Naruto, hold on, I'm working on a route for you as well. The Flash made his way to the north crossroad, but he soon encountered a glass corridor and was obstructed by bees. Then additional bees descended from the ventilation system and encircled him. Guys, they're all over the place, I'm surrounded. The bees suddenly began assaulting him all over, and he batted and swiped in futility. Impulse was still rushing from his bees on the other side of the structure. He swiftly took a fire extinguisher from the wall and began spraying them all, giving him some breathing room and distance. He then went over to Flash and saw him being attacked, so he dashed forward and sprayed extinguisher fluid all over the place to confuse and immobilize the bees as well as swinging the fire extinguisher to kill any he could before grabbing his buddy and jumping out the window. When Joe arrived in his car, Impulse and the Flash were leaping out the second floor window. Naruto clung to Barry as they collided, tucking and rolling to avoid breaking a leg and softening the blow for Barry. As Naruto laid Barry on the ground, they noticed he was covered in bee stings and wasn't breathing. Barry. Joe tried to wake him up, but he wasn't breathing or had a pulse. Naruto yelled over his comms, Sisko, Barry doesn't have a pulse. Stand back. We need to jumpstart his heart. There's a defibrillator in his suit, Sisko said as Naruto and Joe took a step back and Dr. Wells activated the suit's defibrillator. The first pulse lifted his upper torso, 
but he remained asleep until the second one brought him back to consciousness. He was worse for wear, but he'd recover once they returned to Star Laboratories. Jesus Christ, Naruto said, relieved to see Barry alive. He was gasping somewhat but was still alive and breathing. I'll be right back, Joe. Look after him. Joe nodded as Naruto sped back into the building, spraying fire extinguisher fluid and swatting like a madman in the hopes of finding some dead bees, but so far nothing until he arrived at the location where Barry was surrounded and saw one on the ground that wasn't moving. He quickly stepped on it just to be safe, but instead of a squish, he heard a crack. What the hell is going on? Naruto lifted his boot and examined the bee, but instead of a mutated insect, he discovered a bee-designed robot. They returned to Star Labs so Caitlin could check on Barry and make sure he was well. Caitlin gave him a once-over and said he was alright save for minor scratching. Sisko replaced the Flash costume on the mannequin and removed the defibrillator. That's the end of the defibrillator, it's fried, Sisko stated. You're fortunate to be alive, Mr. Allen. We're just lucky Naruto was able to think quickly and get you out of there, Dr. Wells said. Felicity reminded him, I was very specific that you not die. Ray added, yeah. That's a pretty big thing for her. What happened out there, Sisko? I followed your instructions exactly, Barry stated. I apologize. I took you in the wrong direction. The schematics we had weren't up to date, Sisko admitted, apologizing and feeling terrible about his error. What they weren't current? What exactly do you mean? That's never occurred before, Barry stated, perplexed by the situation. Do you think Sisko was trying to kill you? Felicity joked, and Barry became extremely defensive. No why would he do such a thing? That does not make sense. Felicity explained, I know, that's why I was joking. Barry. It's our job to safeguard you, and we failed today, but that will merely serve as a caution for all of us to be more careful in the future, Dr. Wells explained, looking at Cisco for part of the explanation. The good news is that the apotoxin has left your body. Caitlin informed him that his levels had returned to normal. Even better news, I discovered what we're dealing with, Naruto stated holding out a little container that held the bee. He then tossed it to Barry, who panicked a little, believing the bee was still alive, but calmed down as he took a closer look. It's a robot, Barry said as they all peered at the container and saw the crunched remains of a bee-like robot. That is seriously impressive, Sisko exclaimed as Naruto led them to the lab, where he already had holographic scans, schematics, and data of the robot bee on the computer. Yup. This device has a shrunken power source, customized miniature carbon fiber wings, enough circuitry to operate a standard drone, a 360 vision system with several micro lenses, and a strong titanium needle to deliver a concentrated dose of apotoxin. Whoever made this thing wasn't joking, Naruto explained. Amazing, Sisko and Ray exclaimed, giddy with engineering excitement. Caitlin corrected them, saying, disturbing, it's also next generation hardware that only a few labs are capable of producing. One of them is Star Labs, Dr. Wells remarked. Yeah, and given the equipment required to construct something like this, we're definitely dealing with someone who has or has had access to a sophisticated lab, Naruto concluded. We're not dealing with a rogue metahuman, Felicity explained. Just a mad scientist, Barry concluded as Naruto's phone began to ring with a call from Joe. Naruto replied, Hey, Joe. Okay, thanks. Did Joe say something? Brian inquired. He gave me the victim's identification. Bill Carlyle, a robotics expert hired by Folston Tech to expand their robots branch, Naruto responded. Sisko remarked, just like Lindsay Kong, it appears that our mad scientist has a personality, Felicity observed. More likely, she has a hit list, Naruto speculated, but that could give us a way to identify her. Right, let's compare Bill Carlyle's background to Lindsay Kang's and see if we can find a common thread, Dr. Wells said. I'm already on it. Naruto responded, quickly typing on the computer and scanning hundreds of data points in a matter of seconds. I love it when you guys do that, Felicity said, making Barry laugh. Got it. Naruto said, pausing to look over each of their resumes. They both worked at Mercury Labs for their robotics division at the same time. Let's give Joe a call. I think it's time we paid an old friend a visit, Dr. Wells advised. XXXXX line break Naruto, Dr. Wells, and Joe went to see Dr. McGee at Mercury Labs. Naruto told Barry he'd handle it so he could rest and recover from the bee attack, but that didn't exactly take as Barry left with Ray and Felicity to the dinner with Iris and Eddie. Barry was honestly just acting odd, probably due to the whole Iris-Eddie thing if Naruto had to guess. After some waiting in the lobby, they were escorted up to Dr. McGee's office, where she would meet them in a few minutes, she had a meeting to finish but soon arrived. I was a little concerned when I heard you were coming to visit. 
you are truly fighting for the title of Comeback Scientist of the Year. Dr. Wells smiled and said, Always a pleasure, Christina. And Naruto, it's hard to believe that the last time we saw each other, you were working for the CCPD, and now you're my biggest competitor, she said. To be fair, I did state that I was still working in science. Naruto joked, I just never said how far I got. It appears Dr. Wells chose well in you as his protege, she said, leading Naruto and Dr. Wells to chuckle. Joe, on the other hand, was a little apprehensive given Naruto and Dr. Wells' relationship, but that was another story. Are you here to extort me for another Takian prototype, or have you finally found mine? Do you have any more? Both Naruto and Dr. Wells inquired at the same moment. We came here for information, Joe explained, pulling out photographs of the two victims, Bill Carlyle and Lindsay Kong former employees that were recently assassinated. My god. I wasn't aware, Dr. McGee said, surprised. Stung to death by robotic bees, Dr. Wells said, and she immediately understood who was to blame. She informed them, you're looking for Brie Larvin. Who is that? Naruto inquired. A brilliant roboticist who created miniature mechanical bees for agricultural use. I terminated Brie after Kong and Carlyle warned me that she was weaponizing the bees for military use, she revealed as Joe took notes. Well, it appears that you would be on her hit list as well, Doctor, Joe said. You've got to let us keep you safe, Dr. Wells pleaded, only to hear Dr. McGee sigh. I'm well aware of your failure to protect things, Harrison. I can look after myself. Good morning, gentlemen, she said. Thank you, Joe said as they exited her office and entered the elevator to the foyer. That could have been worse. Yeah, but to be fair, the last time we told her to trust us, she lost a highly advanced and expensive prototype that we couldn't protect, so her distrust is kind of a given, Naruto pointed out, and Joe agreed. Plus, Dr. Wells and I are her biggest competitors, and that has to play a role in this, Joe added. However, if Brie Larvin is looking for those who wronged her, Christina is her next target, Dr. Wells remarked. All right, I'll go to the station and see if I can find out anything about her. Last known whereabouts, jobs, and so on. So, how about you? Joe inquired as Naruto deliberated. I'll try to recover it from the robotic bee. Brie will require a lot of space, solitude, and power if she made those items. We'll start a search in the city and let you know what we find, Naruto replied, and Joe agreed. They walked out of Mercury Labs, and Joe drove back to the station, leaving Naruto and Dr. Wells in the Star Labs van. Amen to that, Dr. Wells said as he took them to Big Belly Burger for lunch before returning to Star Laboratories. While Dr. Wells, Naruto, Caitlin, and Sisko worked to find Brie Larvin, Barry was the awkward fifth wheel at a dinner with Eddie, Iris, Ray, and Felicity. Ray, the rich tech owner, had bought out the restaurant so it was just the five of them and, unbeknownst to him at the time, so no one else would witness the awkward situation the dinner would turn into. How did you two meet, Felicity? Eddie inquired. She responded, work. Actually, I bought the company where Felicity worked, and she was forced to join me at Palmer Tech, Ray clarified. Felicity reassured them, it's not as creepy as it sounds. So you two collaborate closely? Interesting, Iris inquired, and they both nodded. I suppose you people disclose all of your thoughts and feelings. Yeah. I share everything with Felicity, Ray replied, making her grin. It's nice that you guys have that level of communication, Iris replied flatly before turning to face Eddie. Oh, no, not everything everything. I mean, sometimes it's better to simply shut up, Felicity explained, attempting to say Eddie. I understand. Some things are better left unsaid, Eddie added. Really? I don't believe that, Iris replied. Everyone began to feel uneasy, and their saving grace arrived in the form of their first course. Oh, thank goodness, it's the food. The food has arrived. The servers arrived and delivered their first course, an egg frittata, but it did little to help with the Eddie, Iris situation. Barry, I've got to admit, I envy you spending so much time at Star Labs. Harrison Wells is like, a personal hero of mine. I mean, it's amazing to be in the same room with him. And I have to admit that even though Naruto is my business rival, everything he's done has me a little in awe. Although it means I have to work extra hard to try and keep up. Ray joked causing them to laugh when Felicity noticed Barry's uneasiness. Ah, uh, I'll be right back, Barry said as he stood up and exited the dining room. He let out a tremendous breath of rage, fear, and what seemed like a panic attack once he was free. Felicity immediately joined him, recognizing that her guess about Barry was correct. Okay, you've been acting strangely since Ray and I arrived in Central City, what's going on with you? Felicity asked, and don't say it's a bad time. Oliver's juggling Roz and the League of Assassins, Laurel's the Black Canary, 
and Thea's training with Malcolm, so I know about bad times. Okay. Uh. Felicity could tell Barry was struggling with this. Joe and I discovered that Wells isn't who he claims to be. He. He is the man who murdered my mother, he's the reverse flash. Oh, but he's been assisting you, I know you want to get faster and stronger. Why? Felicity inquired. I don't know, I don't know anything anymore, particularly who I can and cannot trust, Barry admitted. So, do you think Sisko, Caitlin, and Naruto are helping him? Felicity inquired. That's impossible. Is it? Barry inquired once more. Yes, Barry, they were attempting to save you today, and they did save you, Felicity informed him. Wells has also saved me. Many times. I thought Wells was a great man, and I was so wrong about him. What if I'm wrong about everything else, too? Barry explained. Barry, this is ridiculous, they're your friends and partners. Naruto's been fighting by your side for a year, and he's saved your life more than once. Remember how he stopped you from hurting Eddie and Iris when Rainbow Raider messed with your mind? Or how about helping you save all those people when Captain Cold derailed that train? Felicity reminded him. Yeah, and Dr. Wells saved my life as well, but he's still the man who murdered my mother. And I believe Naruto is working with him. Okay, I know that seems insane, but this drastic change in Naruto's behavior, the times he isn't at Star Laboratories, and let's not forget what occurred in Starling City and when he nearly murdered Oliver and I, Felicity smacked Barry across the face as a result of his words. I'll chalk that last thought up to anxiety because you're going through a lot, but you should be ashamed to even think that. You and I both know that Naruto would never betray you in such a way, and you know what occurred in Starling was an accident. Felicity informed him, everything Naruto has been through proves that he cannot work with the reverse flash, what he did, how he reacted, and all he's done to attempt to rebuild himself is proof enough that he's on your side. If you can't see that, you have no idea how excellent a friend you have. Ray peered out the door to the dining room before any of them could continue. Hello, folks. Things are getting a little heated in here. Eddie and Iris were arguing back and forth, and it was reaching a boiling point. Please, can't we just have a nice evening? So it's my fault that we're not having a pleasant evening. Your girlfriend is me. Who you share your home with, you shouldn't have to beg me to talk to you. Iris informed him. Believe me, if I could talk to you about this, I would. But I won't be able to. Eddie explained it to her for the hundredth time. Do you know what? I'm no longer hungry. Iris stood up and grabbed her purse. Do you know what? Call me when you're ready to behave like we're two people in love. I'll be at my father's. Eddie needed to be alone when Iris stormed out the door. I'm going home. Have a wonderful evening. Eddie said his goodbyes. Suffice it to say, the supper didn't last long, and the trio decided to call it quits and head to Star Labs. Naruto was working on the computers in the Cortex while eating a big belly burger. Dr. Wells was working on something, Caitlin went out to eat, and Sisko went to work on Ray's suit. Naruto had the computer running a tracking algorithm for any kind of leads on Brie Larvin, as well as monitoring the bee's distinctive energy signature and working frequencies. Joe had no luck with the cops, so it was up to them to find her. To assist with this and dealing with the potential vast army of robotic bees, Naruto was constructing a new pair of repulsor energy gauntlets similar to the ones that had previously been smashed by Orochimaru. Because he already had the design, he was simply rebuilding a new pair with minor tweaks. They were sleeker, more form-fitting, and significantly less bulky than the previous pair. He also reworked the circuitry and power source so that it could take the kinetic and electrical energy he generated when running in a more efficient manner. He was also installing a built-in scanner. When he received a text message on his phone, he adjusted the last wire and began welding the armor components into place. He set down his soldering iron and checked the message, which read. I can't believe how much attention and success you're receiving. You're making a difference in the world. I'm sure your family is kicking themselves for how things went down with your mother. Cousin, I am extremely proud of you. Don't be a stranger and think of me lovingly when you become too famous and wealthy for me. When Naruto read the message, he smiled and responded back. I doubt I could ever forget you, no matter how hard I tried. We'll talk soon. A message from M's Park. Naruto turned around to see Dr. Wells enter the cortex. No, it was Karen. Only a text message of congratulations. Ah, yes. I take it that despite everything you've done, you have yet to hear from your mother's side of the family in Japan? Dr. Wells inquired, and Naruto replied, no. It's all right, Dr. Wells. I've been fine for the past 13 years, I'm not expecting a large family gathering. When Sisko returned to the lab to retrieve certain goods, Naruto assured him. How is everything going with the atom suit? Things are looking up so far. We recently finished upgrading the fuel cells, but we still need to test them to make sure they're working properly. 
As Barry stepped into the cortex, he was still wearing his dinner suit, but his tie was undone and loosened. Hey, Barry. Hey, how was your dinner? Naruto was perplexed. Awkward is an understatement. Iris and Eddie fought the entire time and departed in a huff, Barry stated. Sorry, dude. When the satellites detected a distinctive electronic signature traveling around the city, Naruto responded. What's that? Sisko inquired. The satellites have picked up on something. Naruto accessed the satellite data and saw a significant cluster with the distinctive signal traveling east. Oh boy. What is it? Barry inquired. It's the bees, says the narrator. They're on the go once more. Naruto informed him. This is Bree. She's on the hunt for Tina, said Dr. Wells. As Felicity, Caitlin, and Ray arrived, Naruto and Barry hurriedly changed into their suits. How do we put a stop to them? Naruto tightened his belt and grabbed his goggles while Barry zipped up his suit. She's got to be piloting those bees remotely from somewhere, Dr. Wells spoke up. We have to stop this woman with the bug-eyed glasses, Sisko stated. And her miniature bandits, Ray added when they were both struck by a name for Bree. The bug-eyed bandit. Felicity was working on the computer when she discovered the electronic signature of the bee cluster. I've got her. She's in a deserted greenhouse. You two must remove Bree. It's the only way to bring those nano drones to a halt. Dr. Wells informed them. What about you, Dr. McGee? Barry inquired. Your suit's defibrillator is broken. You must not approach Mercury Laboratories, Caitlin informed him. Strategy of division and conquest. I'll keep the drones busy while Barry takes down their queen, Naruto proposed. You saw what happened to Barry, Naruto. Your new outfit is stronger than the old, but I doubt it will keep the bees at bay, Sisko informed him. All I have to do is stay one step ahead of them. Something tells me I'll have the upper hand in the open. Besides, I'm not about to allow a deranged scientist hurt Dr. McGee. Naruto approached and put on his repulsor gauntlets, but because they weren't done, they only had the metal frame, circuitry, and palm bases. They weren't armored, but they were still functional. Besides, these could use a test run. Be careful, both of you. Dr. Wells exclaimed as Naruto nodded and raced out of the cortex in a whirl of crimson and white lightning. Dr. Wells. Tina will be protected by Naruto, Barry. Go. As Barry dashed out of the lab, Dr. Wells reassured him. While Sisko fed him the swarm's location from Star Labs, Impulse raced through the city with his goggles plotting the quickest route to Mercury Labs. The swarm was clustered outside Dr. McGee's window as Bree spoke her final words before the glass began to fracture. I can see them, said Impulse. Felicity, do you think you can jam their frequency? I tried before, but I may be able to redirect them to a different target. Get ready, Naruto, you're about to have an incoming, Felicity informed him. Please send them my way. I'm prepared for a rematch. He raced up the side of Mercury Labs Tower and circled the swarm several times, releasing a few blasts from his repulsors that shattered dozens of drones into small pieces before rushing down and away from Dr. McGee. He sprinted down the streets as the bees pursued him, and while they were quick, he was faster. Okay, I've got them on my tail. You're up, Barry. Take her out. Roger, that. Bree was at a high-tech handmade computer control center when the flash arrived at the greenhouse. Bree, it's over. I know you're attempting to murder. McGee, doctor you believe she has betrayed you. I can picture how that feels. You think you know what it's like to betray someone? I'll show you what it's like to be stung. Bree punched a button on her console, summoning an even greater swarm of bee drones. The flash dashed away and began a game of keep away with the drones, but being inside a structure was much more difficult than being outside. Naruto, there's a swarm after Barry. I must assist, Felicity informed him. That's fine, Felicity. I've got it. Impulse continued to race down the streets, with the bees chasing him. He walked through the city and noticed the docks and riverfront approximately 20 blocks distant. Fortunately, technology has one universal truth. He turned towards the river, the bees following, ignorant they were on their way to their destiny. When he was close enough, he sped onto the water and began sprinting in a huge circle, generating a small water tornado that soaked the bee drones. Even though they were cutting-edge technology, they couldn't stand up to water and died like flies. Impulse came to a halt on the sidewalk and tapped his ear communicator. Everything is okay here. The bees are going for a swim, he informed everyone. Bree is reserved. Call the CCPD, Flash provided information. Boom, drop the mic, Felicity yelled over the intercom, making Barry and Naruto laugh. Joe and the CCPD apprehended Bree and confiscated all of her technology at her hideout. Dr. McGee was happy to hear that so that no more individuals were harmed. 
She went to the station the next morning to give her statement, but she stopped by to see Barry first. Dear Mr. Allen, do you have a minute? She inquired. Of course, yeah. How can I assist you? I just finished with Detective West, but I wanted to come apologize. Barry was perplexed as she said. I should have heeded your colleague's warnings about Bree. Maybe next time I'll accept the CCPD's offer of protection. After we lost your tack-in prototype, I can understand why you were hesitant to trust us. Barry said as she nodded and walked away, but he had a few questions for her. May I ask you a question? Naruto mentioned that you've known him and Dr. Wells for quite some time. Yes, I worked with his parents before they went to work at Star Labs for a few years. They were decent individuals, and Dr. Wells before circumstances made it impossible, she informed him. Do you mind if I ask you what happened between you two? As Dr. McGee took a long breath, Barry wondered. I constantly ask myself that question. Harrison and I were as close as thieves 15 years ago. In Starling City, we were bright young scientists. He was a wonderful man, but everything changed when Tess died, she informed him. Were they going to marry? I understand how grief can affect people, but this was more. Harrison Wells seems to have changed entirely after that day. But I find it amusing that Naruto's parents were undeterred and persisted with him, and now Naruto is following in their footsteps years later, she stated. What exactly do you mean? Barry was perplexed. They were the only people Harrison never pushed away before the accident. Minato and Kashina were wonderful scientists and people, but I'm sure they noticed the same changes in Harrison as I did. Nonetheless, they were with him till the very end. Perhaps Harrison desired his relationship with them more, and I hate to say it, but I imagine Naruto wouldn't be the person he is today if Harrison Wells wasn't in his life. She explained before bidding Barry farewell, leaving him with a lot to ponder. Despite what Felicity informed him, there remained a part of Barry's mind that couldn't shake the thought that Naruto and Dr. Wells were so close. They were nearly family, something no one else in the group could match. Sisko and Caitlin had been with him for years, but Dr. Wells knew Naruto's parents, had mentored him as a child, and was still doing so now. Was it possible that he and Dr. Wells were collaborating? When Ray and Felicity walked over to say farewell to Naruto, he was finishing up with his repulsor gauntlets at Star Labs. Hey, I just wanted to say goodbye before we left. As Naruto stood up and hugged her, she said. And so another exciting time in Central City comes to an end. Hopefully, one of these days when you visit, things will be quiet. Naruto chuckled as he shook Ray's hand. Ray, it was a pleasure to meet you. And I hope you won't mention your little escapade here. Certainly, but it was entertaining to watch you work. Not only have I gotten my suit's new power system to operate, but I've also planned an upgrade. I kept thinking I needed to go bigger when, in fact, I needed to go smaller. He raised a little case containing one of the bee drones. I'll be able to use the bee's nano power source to work out the self-powering ionizing reaction you suggested. Well, if you need anything, just give us a call, and if you're coming back, just let us know. Felicity crossed her heart as Naruto told them. Tell Oliver and the others that we said hello. It has been noted. Hopefully, the next time we meet each other, it will be for drinks rather than disaster. She had hoped. Here's to hoping. Naruto made a pledge. To be continued. That's it for this podcast. Thanks for listening to this video. If you did enjoy this part of the story, like, share, and subscribe for more. And thank you all for having support. And have a great day.